Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another episode of the Space Here Tech Podcast. It's been a minute, and we are glad to have the audience back and with another really interesting guest. But first, before that, today we are going to be talking about an interesting topic, something that has been a buzzword. You know, you uh, go anywhere on tech Twitter and it's you, you will not uh, not run into it. The word is fintech. You know, uh, I saw a tweet some time back that said, if you want to do anything startup and you want to get funding as fast as possible, do something in fintech. You'll get funding instantly. And today we want to talk about fintech and the future of fintech in the African space. And one person I know who is passionate about fintech always talking about fintech if you're in the kenyan tech tech twitter space you have heard about him and nala we have saruni Maina, who is an enthusiast and somebody who works in the fintech space how are you saruni how are you how have you been how is nala what, a, what an introduction so you know because we're talking about fintech and you ask uh-huh. about nala just mm-hmm. as FYI, there's a fintech startup called Nala. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I've, I've seen that. Seen that. So, yeah. so in, in this case, we are not talking about the fintech startup. Mm-hmm. And if Benji mm-hmm. happens to listen to this, <laughs> hey, Benji, he's the CEO of Nala Money. Uh-huh. But we, we, we're actually talking about you know, my baby. Mm-hmm. Um, so Nala. Nala is good. Nala is good. I'm Nala sure is fine. Is. Yeah, taking you to road trip. The love. I'm telling all you, the taking love. me everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So yeah. yeah, when he's not catching Ubers, he's talking about fintechs, and there's just a lot to be to be talked about in the fintech space. Uh, the other day, the uh, one of the Kenyan startups, uh, Tender, secured a 5.4 million in dollar funding. Uh, Tender works with the digital lending, and it's also uh, it it's also offers financial management solutions. There is uh, news about MTN in South Africa opening up their money market to explore mobile money in the country. And uh, Rwanda, I saw something on Rwanda. Rwanda had uh, opened up. What did they do? I forgot. But yes, Rwanda is doing something and they're also in the digital space. So there's a lot that's happening in Africa on a digital platform for fintech. So we have Saruni here who, yes, as you've heard, is just roaming around with Nala. We want to talk (laughs) to him about fintech. And so just to begin, what would you describe fintech as to somebody who has not heard about it, is curious about it, and maybe has not had a platform to explore what fintech means? Um, so to add to your list uh, mm-hmm. first, um, yeah. MultiChoice is also working on a fintech product. Really? Is, <laughs> yep. The makers of DSTV want a piece of the cake. <laughs> wow. It looks like if I want to be a CEO at this rate, I'm getting into fintech. Uh, and I'm coming well, to you as my mentor. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> I, yeah. Hey, I also need mentors. <laughs> you need mentors. <laughs> I also need mentors, but yeah. So... You know, uh, fintech in its in its literal word is just financial technology. So mm. um, it's derived from you know it was it was it came to a time whereby someone somewhere were, or maybe a group of people somewhere were tired of banks. Essentially, they were like, yeah. okay, it's taking way too long to open an account. It's taking right. way too long for me to send money, even in, within the same country. It's yeah. taking way too long to send money across different countries. And even until today, you know, not to throw shade at any bank, but we know certain <laughs> banks that every weekend there's maintenance. You know, <laughs> like, right? you're wondering, yeah, no. what, what, yeah, what are you fixing every weekend? Why are there so many downtimes? And all of this calculated and someone decided, you know what, we are going to make a bank mm-hmm. that does not behave like a normal a bank. bank. Right. So, and this, this is why you see a lot of fintechs are, are looking like banks or maybe yeah. are providing services that look and feel like banks because you know, that know. was the spine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're actually not banks. That was the spine of the whole fintech era, which was right. how can we provide services that allow people to, you know, open, open accounts instantly, send money, and yeah. without having all these hassles of filling up papers and stuff. 
So right. that is essentially where fintech started, and that is what fintech still is today. And mm. just to also mention, it is what makes fintech very strong and yeah. well financed, and it's also what makes fintech a problem in what makes people feel like maybe we shouldn't have fintech because we already have banks. Right. It's like a conflict yeah. of interest. Uh, not really a conflict of interest. It's like, you know, when when you're trying to disrupt someone that you That's still really need. There. Yes, yes. Yes. So you're, you're trying guess. to cut off the leg, but you still need mm-hmm. that leg to work. Literally trying to kill the master, somebody who tried to <laughs> Exactly. That was, that's what brings about the problem. Yeah. Right. So, so, so yeah. there was the need for banks that are not banks because maybe banks are not very accessible in the past, or still are not to make, to a majority of the population in Kenya and also Africa as a whole. So, hence, you know, that need. So, with the with that, what can you say is the current state of fintech in Africa? You know, what, what does it look like? Mm-hmm. Because it's been there for a couple so, of years. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say it's, it's quite healthy. Uh, mm-hmm. There's very, 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 very many fintech startups. So many. Mm-hmm. If you look at Nigeria, <laughs> I bet you, I wouldn't say too many, but <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, I bet you if you throw, if you throw a stone within, mm-hmm. you know, a radius of 10 kilometers, you'll probably you'll hit a fintech, fintech. founder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And right. you come to Kenya, and it's not as robust in Kenya just because mm. of M-Pesa, you know. Yeah. So for us, we have one major fintech service, yeah. and then multiple other smaller fintechs that are built upon that service. Mm. While in Nigeria, we have a banking service, and then multiple fintechs mm. built fintech around fintech. that banking service. Yes. Uh-huh. And it's a, it's a similar story across very different markets, South Africa, uh, Uganda is also becoming quite vibrant. Wonder, yeah, uh, the yeah. Francophone side has always been marginalized when it comes to fintechs, but we are seeing more and more of those popping up. Mm. So the, the current market uh, within the continent of Africa, I would say, is well spread, but mm. also very fragmented, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Fragmented in that because we have so many fintech products, so many fintech yeah. companies, yeah. these fintech companies don't talk to each other. Right. You know, um, every fintech company, every fintech startup, every fintech product wants to operate in a silo, wants to do their own thing. You know, they want to come in and be like, okay, my fintech is called Payday. Uh, mm-hmm. I allow you to use, uh, you know, virtual cards to pay for Netflix, allow you mm-hmm. to send money to your friends or to send money yeah. to the US. And then yeah. another one comes, okay. mine is called, exactly, mine is called Chipa, and I do the exact same thing. And then another yeah. one comes and says, oh, mine is called XYZ, and I do the exact same thing. The other day, I saw there was another one called LiFi, you see, and they do the exact same thing. And the problem here with that is that it creates a lot of fragmentation. Yeah. And now it becomes a battle of, can we convince Saruni to, to be our customer? Yes. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that battle of, which app do I keep on my phone? And now the funny story here is, which I, I would love to dive more into, especially right. when you're talking about, you know, the fintech uh, space in Africa, is that yeah. I probably need all these apps. The reason being, mm-hmm. most times, out of five apps, at a given time, only one yeah. will do what you want it to do. Yeah. So if you have apps A, B, C, D, E, those are five. And yeah. today, I want to send money to South Africa. Mm-hmm. I can bet you A will work, B, C, D, E will not work. <laughs> and then tomorrow, I want to send the same money, the same amount to South Africa. A will not work, D will work, and the rest also will not work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Since there's so there's the issue of stability. Yes, now that, that's the other issue. Uh, our apps here are not that stable. Yeah. And because from, from my perspective, I think it's because a lot of focus is put on customer acquisition. And then mm. a lot of focus is also put on, you know, how cheap can we make it? Because you see, we are all fighting for the same uh, customer base. So mm. how can we convince these 10 people, all of them to download my app and not download the other person's app? So I will put my prices down. I will do ABCD, you know, I'll do a lot of promos and all of those things. 
But the problem is my brain, my, the technology that is underlying that makes this app work it's is not, not founded. Yeah, it's not as good. Mm. And one of the reasons that is also is because they rely on banks. So the b- banks are still providing yeah. the same rails that as fintechs we are trying to disrupt. Then right. that becomes a problem because we already know banks are not uh, reliable. And that is why fintech was born. But now yeah. imagine fintech is having to rely on banks <laughs> to work. <laughs> we are to back to the same good. problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that brings up a very interesting conversation about the financial inclusion and access. You know, the way yeah. that we need banks to, banks rely on, on, on fintech solutions and fintech solutions rely on banks and brings up uh-huh. the, the, the topic about the lending, credit lending and credit scoring models and building yeah. this on technology and providing loans to all this, the population. And, you know, it brings up a lot of the rise of digital lending platforms. And, you know, there's so many, especially in Kenya. And I think in Nigeria, yeah. there's one called Branch in Kenya and Carbon yes. in Nigeria. Yeah. yeah. So it's, they, they come in, they bring in a lot of money in funding and then, you know, they have the same problem. Many people come in, they can lend them, they can borrow money and then returning the money becomes a problem and we're back to the same yeah. equation again. Yeah. yeah, that is very true. And it's, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the lending side of fintech, you know, uh, mm-hmm. all these digital lenders, mobile apps came in because they were like, we want to improve financial inclusion. One of the ways mm-hmm. to, improve, to improve rather financial inclusion is by, you know, giving access to customers, uh, yes. like for credit access, you know. Yeah. If, if as a customer, I can access uh, credit facilities very easy and fast, Mm -hmm. then you've increased financial inclusion because it means if I want to do business, I'm able to do exactly that very fast. But then the problem with that is that, you know, I'll give an example of the Kenyan context. We have very cheeky customer base that Mm -hmm. um, it got to a time whereby um, Kenyans would borrow from branch, (laughs) borrow from Tala, borrow from KCB and PESA, and borrow from Mshuari. And and then and Fuliza as well. And then at the end of the month, when all this is due, they'll pay back branch, borrow again, pay Tala, borrow again, pay, you know, it's like taking from one hand to the other and it's all going in a circle. So a few years back, I think like two years back, branch Mm -hmm. and Tala actually had to sit down together. And they were like, okay, we need to share a database. You know, we need to share a database of defaulters because Mm -hmm. clearly we are suffering. You know, for someone exactly. is borrowing money. Well, you see, you're, you're sharing the database of defaulters. In this case, you're trying to see, is this person credit worthy? Yeah. That is a similar thing with what banks do. That is why a bank will ask you about, if you've ever actually taken a loan from a bank, a bank will ask mm-hmm. you, oh, there's this loan you have at KCB. <sighs> let's, say you, let's say you bank with equity. They'll ask you, there's this loan you have at KCB. So, uh-huh. because they know, they share these details. <laughs> if, if you actually don't, if you actually don't share this information with the, within the financial industry, you are mm-hmm. in for trouble. And that is the other thing that has ailed, um, that has ailed a fintech startup. Because like I mentioned earlier, they operate in silos, which means yeah. that they don't have visibility over each other, uh, yes. you know? Uh, mm-hmm. And the other day I saw Nigerian fintechs trying to come together to share fraud, you know, fraud data between themselves. So if Saruni is identified as a fraud in app A, that information is shared across the board. So they know that if they see Saruni in app B, they ban me immediately. You know? <laughs> so it, it, it is a way of trying to survive because yeah. people will always come and try to beat the market. You know, they'll always be smarter yeah. than you. Exactly. They always find so a way. Exactly. One of the ways to survive has been to share information with each other and be like, okay, we've given X amount of money to person. And you know, the funny thing is um, part of your credit score, actually not part, your credit score is actually a public information. Mm. So if you go today and you Google, or rather not really Google, but and you search your credit score, anyone can access that information. Any bank can access that information. Uh-huh. Now it's deeper with the banks because now the banks are able to dig deeper and see which mm. institution gave you credit. 
did you pay that credit facility? So with that, they're able to assess you, assess your risk and be like, okay, so clearly this person is able to pay back our money. This person right. is not able to pay back our money because of yeah. course they didn't pay back KCB. What's to say they'll pay back equity, you know? True, that's true. Yeah. Okay, nice. So that that um, that conversation brings about another, yet another layered conversation about regulatory environments and policy you know because yeah. you're talking about like a regulatory sandbox and i think that is initiated by the central bank of kenya right to yeah, allow yeah, yeah. the banks or fintech startups to uh, to test uh, or to share a database and also to test their innovations across uh, a controlled environment before they can yeah. either bring it up in the market or also scale it what what do you think about this regulatory environment is it is it enough is it uh, should it be improved? Is it a healthy one? You know, like what what is what is the regulatory environment looking like for the fintech? So, uh, what I could say, and just to touch on, I would say Kenya because well, this is where we are currently based. Yeah, is that we we've come a really long way in terms of regulations, uh, and specifically CBK itself. Um, give credit where credit is due. CBK has made some great style, strides when it comes to regulating the free tech space. Um, generally, of course, we, you know, uh, as builders, as founders, as people who work within the fintech space, we would we'd always like for that regulation to be, you know, a bit more friendly, but that is not always the case. However, as it stands right now, it's actually not as bad because uh, I'll give the example of, you know, um, the example of lenders, when it came to the digital lenders, you know, CBK was like, okay, so these are the rules that we have for you to follow. We want you to apply for a license. And if you follow these rules and get your license, then you can operate in Kenya. And we've seen quite a number of, you know, these uh, startups actually get licensed and they're now legally operating as digital lenders. While a while back, there used to be a pandemic of random, you know, uh, fintech uh, lenders, just opening up, people were complaining about how unethical they were when it yeah. came to, you know, chasing their money back and all of those things, <laughs> data protection, you know. They can it was, be quite it was ruthless. <laughs> exactly. It was a pandemic yeah. by itself. And yeah. now you see when CBK came in, all that has become, you know, streamlined. Now we know that for you to operate as a digital lender, you need to get a license, you need to have data protection in place. This is how yeah. you handle whenever customers default. To handle it with dignity, you know, you just, you just don't go doing random things. So because yeah. of that, I actually do commend our regulator. Of course, there's, there's the other side of free tech when it comes to matters cryptocurrency, where mm -hmm. we've felt that, of course, the regulator would have been, you know, a bit more friendly to, to that mm -hmm. as opposed to giving a hard no. You know, it's, it's a matter of, okay, let's sit down, let's discuss. How can Nigeria, we... How can we Nigeria is implementing their cryptocurrency as part of the fintech. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So Nigeria is actually building regulation around cryptocurrency. So yeah. Africa is doing the same. Our neighbors in Uganda, actually, yeah. as much as that's a whole other pandemic, our neighbors in Uganda <laughs> had also actually, you know, said okay to cryptocurrency and were right. having a regulation, a regulation in place. Uh, mm. But as much as we are seeing this, kind of things happening with different regulators. Botswana would be the leading one currently because Botswana already has a regulatory framework. Uh, mm -hmm. You can go apply for, to become a cryptocurrency provider, you know, uh, or a licensed cryptocurrency exchange, you know, in Botswana. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen a number of people try to apply for that. I think mm -hmm. currently the only one that holds that kind of license is Yellow Card, and where I actually where you currently are? work. Yes. Yeah. So we, we do hold a license, you know, um, in Botswana. So we, 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 we totally appreciate these kinds of efforts whenever regulators come and say, okay, we see what you're doing yeah. and we support that. Because speaking on the regulation part, I understand personally where the mm -hmm. problem usually comes. You know, um, crypto in itself has always been pushed as, you know, it's decentralized, it's anonymous, no one yeah. can see your transactions, no one can know what you're doing. And yeah. that is what makes regulators afraid. Because yeah. the, the number one crime within the financial sector is money laundering, you know? Mm -hmm. they, yeah. So people trying to move money for the wrong reason, you know, finding the wrong things, uh, this wash-wash behavior that we have in Kenya, 
you know, Washed all of those off. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, when the regulation, when the regulator hears that, oh, you guys want to bring Bitcoin into Kenya, the same mm-hmm. Bitcoin that we can't, we can't monitor these transactions. We can't we know can't see. when. Yeah, but we can't see money. what what is happening. Yeah. Right. So it means that financial crimes can be committed very easily, and yeah. there won't be anyone to regulate that. So mm-hmm. it's come to a time where by crypto players we have to come and sit down with regulators and be like, okay, so for example, like us as yellow card, this yeah. is what we are trying to do. We are using yeah. stable coins to power X, Y, Z. You know, mm-hmm. we are using crypto to power X, Y, Z. We are able to use, you know, the power of stable coins to do remittance business. We're able to use the power of stable coins to allow businesses in Africa to pay for importation of goods. Let's say, for example, in the US, in China, mm-hmm. in the UAE. Yeah with different and various partners. So yeah. players like ourselves that are trying to build, I, I like to call them real life and real world use cases of crypto. You know, yeah. we, we are trying to change that narrative where crypto is seen like a scam kind of thing, a get rich quick kind of, you know, uh, yeah. k- kind of pyramid scheme. Yeah. Because yeah. actually a few years ago, that was all crypto was known for. You know, you, yeah. you buy low, you sell high and you're rich and that's it. There was no actual real world use case, but I can mm-hmm. tell you today we are seeing a lot of a lot of real world use cases with people sending money to their families using crypto, people doing remittance using crypto, people paying for goods and services using crypto. So, for instance, I, I could employ the services of Spacia Tech. You know, mm-hmm. I'd be like, okay, I need this website done, I need this website made, and let's say, for example, I live in South Africa and I need to pay you guys for that. If I go and look at other platforms that do remittance, the cost can be a bit high. And yeah. sometimes the money will take too long to get to you. But if I, if I was to send you that money through a service like Yellowpay, or which, which, is, which is a remittance service that we have, mm-hmm. that money, you get it instantly. And the reason for that is because of the range that, and the technology at the back end that we are, we are using. We're using stable coins to ensure that this money is able to go from one end to you instantly. Yeah. Okay. Do you yeah, think so, you, do you think the um, the resistance to to uh, getting maybe the uh, what is it what is it cryptocurrency in the market is due to maybe infrastructure limitations or is it just a lack of digital literacy? Um, I wouldn't say it's lack of digital literacy. To be honest, because you'd be very surprised how much these regulators actually know. Uh-huh. I think on a, on, a personal, on a personal opinion, I think the biggest issue is the infrastructure side, especially when it comes to transaction monitoring, mm-hmm. just because of how you know, the blockchain is set up to be anonymous and a, a, bit, of, a bit of it untraceable. Yeah. That is what gives regulators the cold fix. They're like, mm-hmm. we don't want to open this Pandora box. And then Kidogo Kidogo... Exactly, mm. kidogo kidogo, uh, corruption has soared 100 percent because yeah. now you know people are making payments through crypto and the right. government instead is not of able Switzerland, to track. instead of Switzerland, yeah. it's now cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah, you're not, even, you're not even taking your money out of Kenya, it's instant yeah. there. Then. <laughs> yeah, you hide it immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that is the other risk. And then I would say, on our side as crypto players, you'd find um, some platforms are not willing. To, mm-hmm. to put in these measures whereby we are able to monitor and, you know, monitor transactions within the crypto space. Um, there is, of course, tools already on blockchain that are, we are able to monitor money laundering and suspicious activities, things like chain analysis. We're able to use such tools to be able to do transaction monitoring on the blockchain. But you're mm-hmm. finding that these, these startups that don't want to take advantage of this, you know, of these tools, they're saying, oh, we need to be decentralized, you know, yeah. we need to be, we, we don't need to conform to government and what governments want. And it's becoming an issue of the chicken and the egg, like, you know, what, what comes from? Yeah. Yes, exactly. If you want, if you want mass adoption for crypto within Kenya, it means crypto companies need to operate freely. But mm. crypto companies cannot operate freely if the regulator is not comfortable with that. <laughs> Yeah. True. So it means that crypto companies need to sit down with the regulator, agree on, okay, this is where we, th- we think we can work together. The regulator would be like, this is what makes us uncomfortable. Can you solve this for us? And then on our side as crypto players, we can show that, okay, we've actually already solved this problem. So we can actually do this. 
And then once you do all of that, then once we have a regulatory approval and a regulatory environment, we're able to transact freely, we're able to put up our billboards, and we're also now able to do the last mile, which is education. And we are able to tell, you know, uh, direct consumers that, hey, Mamboga, you can also get paid in crypto and it's actual money, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's dollars, actually. I, I <laughs> love talking about digital dollars, you know, USDC, USDT, because essentially what that is, it's actual dollars. And, you know, no one doesn't love to be paid in dollars. Right now, the dollar is almost hitting one foot. So if I, if, I, if, I could pay you, if I could pay you in actual dollars, don't you think you'd be very happy about that? Extremely happy. <laughs> Extremely happy. <laughs> and that is the power of stable coins. That's the power that we are, we are constantly fighting to unlock. But, of course, we cannot, we cannot bury our heads in the sand and pretend that, you know, we are going to bulldoze our way through things. We also acknowledge and know that we need to work with government and regulators. Right. Yeah, and that that you just read my mind. I was I was just going to ask about collaboration and partnerships. You talked about uh, uh, these uh, organizations or companies working in silos and you know it hurting the ecosystem. So what what do you yeah. think are some of the importance of collaborations between these fintech companies, traditional financing financial institutions, and government agencies? Why do they need to work together? And are there any successful collaborations or partnerships that have enhanced finance financial services in Africa? If yes, what what are the, what is the future of this these future collaborations in the continent? Mm. Okay, nice. Um, so. I would say the number one benefit would be interoperability. So mm -hmm. just to give an example, and of course, mobile money is also fintech. So right. M-Pesa M -Pesa yeah. provides itself as the largest yeah. fintech. Uh, and true to it, hats off to M-Pesa because M-Pesa has really grown to prove that, yes, it can be a fintech. And mm. the services that they have today also are hand in hand to what a fintech would be able to do. You know, yeah. things like the virtual card, uh, and yeah. Global, which is their, their remittance play and all of those things. Um, yeah. So in this case, um, I'd like to use interoperability and m as a very good example. So mm -hmm. uh, a few months back, I was in Rwanda and I was yeah. able to pay a for services country. in Rwanda, yeah. <laughs> a very beautiful and clean country, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's really clean. Uh, I wish we were that clean. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was surprised and very really pleasantly surprised, if I may say, that I was yeah. able to do an M-Pesa transaction and pay for my cab directly into their mobile wallet. Yeah, they have. Yeah, so, I was, I was, I was, I also visited Rwanda and that was, it came as a lifesaver, especially when you think. Exactly. Yeah. It's such a lifesaver, honestly. <laughs> because the one thing, the funny thing about Rwanda is a good number of places don't accept cards. So yeah. they're going to be like, either cash or momo mobile money so i was like no okay more, no more pay. Then I, yeah then i realized okay so i could actually do safari from mpesa to mtn momo and i yes. did that and after doing that i've never turned back <laughs> i do that in every All the time. country yes even in uganda you do, you just do that and it's it's very seamless and it works yes. you know and all this works because mtn and safaricom Mm -hmm. agreed to work together and be interoperable mm -hmm. you know they were like okay we need to be able to we need to be able to send money between safaricom and mtn because the truth is mpesa is not active in rwanda mpesa yeah. is not active in uganda but mm -hmm. mpesa users want to be able to send money to this country yeah so That's the good. only way for us to achieve that yeah. yeah the only way for us to achieve that is to work with someone who's already big in those countries yeah. Because part of, part of competition is when you realize that I cannot fight someone else. If, you, if, you, if, if as a person you sit down and look, yeah, and you see that, oh, I can't beat MTN in, in Rwanda because I'm not even interested in expanding to Rwanda. So what do I do? I, I partner with MTN and we are able to benefit both of us. Yeah. So that is the one that is the one thing that has been amazing in terms of collaboration between fintech platforms interoperability has been super awesome and that is the also that's the other thing that will benefit these other neo banks you know the mm. likes of kuda bank in nigeria loop itself i would say our quote in quote neo bank in kenya <laughs> uh we had we had the other day what is it called fingo fingo launching yeah, fingo. so 
Yes. You see, are you are quite a of, critic. You are quite a critic of Fingo. I saw. I saw. Well, so, because okay, <laughs> I don't want to speak ill of them, but I don't believe <laughs> in launching a product that yeah. is not working the one. You know, right. it, it makes people not very enthusiastic about the product itself. And there's some so, resistance anyway, to the app. <laughs> exactly that, but that's a story for another day. So if right. all these apps, you know, could work together, and I was able to make a payment from. Let's say, for example, M-Pesa into mm-hmm. an app like Payday in Nigeria. That mm-hmm. would make me happy. You know, that would make me awesome because it means I don't need to wait for Payday to launch in Kenya. And Payday probably does not even need to launch in Kenya. They can just concentrate in the market where they are best known for or where the market where they're really good in. You know, if they're really good in Nigeria, you focus on that, build your product there, and then connect to other platforms and you are able to be interoperable and that is the one thing also that i'm starting to see a lot of um within you know especially when it comes to the meet and play uh we are seeing platforms like wise and revolut and the other likes trying to partner with local fintechs you know how can we be able to send money from you know europe directly into mpesa how can we be able to send money from Europe directly into Payday? How can we be able to send money from Europe directly into this other application? So we, we, are seeing, we are seeing a lot of that happening. And it shows that, you know, players have realized, I don't need to expand into Africa. You know, I, I, I don't need to expand into Africa myself. If there, there's already African players, what I can do is if I can connect to them, then that is something that we could potentially do. You know, one of the biggest partnerships that we have currently at Yellow Card is with the company that owns Cash App in the States. And we, we are working on you know, some amazing things together with them. And I really can't wait for that launch because it's going to unlock a corridor that is going to, I believe, is going to be very, very good for the mm. continent itself. Right. You know, especially when it comes to remittance. I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing that. I know you'll be talking about <laughs> it if the time is right. So, yeah, I'm not worried yeah, about it. So. Yeah. So, now you're talking about uh, outside players or the players that are not in the African continent being able to, to do all these things within the continent without being really in the continent. So, how yeah. would you say the financial inclusion in Africa is now that fintech is becoming a really big name in the continent? What, how, how, is the, how is fintech driving the financial inclusion in Africa? So, the one thing I would just like to acknowledge right now is that mm-hmm. I accept that myself and many others live in a bubble. Um, right. And it's the bubble of being a city kid. So when I see a city you know, kid... I'm talking to you right now, and low-key, you're saying things, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so now, yes. Now, we yeah. So we, we live in a bubble, and yourself too as well. Yes. You know, um, there's the bubble of, you know, we have smartphones, we have yeah. technology, we are it's able to open apps. Hand. You know, yes. yes. So yeah. that is now, if we are talking about that, we can easily say that, oh, financial inclusion should even be at 90%, you know? Right. Because that is the bubble that it looks like. Our, our close friends, the people around us, they all mm-hmm. have it. Especially in Kenya, actually, I believe Kenyans live a lot in a bubble. You know, in right. Kenya, people can say financial inclusion is at 90%. Almost everyone has a pesa. So you're like, yeah. okay, financial inclusion is good. Until mm-hmm. you go to another country whereby then, everything is done then, via cash. Yes. yes. Yeah. Everything is done via cash. People don't even have bank accounts. People don't have mobile money wallets. Yeah. And then you realize there's a lot to be done. And this is why, I'll actually say this, this is why we are seeing a lot and a lot of fintechs coming up every mm. other day. Mm. Because the problem has not yet been solved. Right. The only challenge here is that if we are having all the fintechs trying to do the same thing, then we are not really solving the problem. We are going in circles once again. But if, if we were solving different, you know, different problems, targeting different markets, then mm. probably we'd see a lot more financial inclusion. We'd see that number go high and high and high. But the problem right now is that because we, we live in a bubble and the, the problem is that we are also trying to solve easy problems. Yeah. 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 We are trying to solve easy problems. Because right now, we are barely at 50% 
in terms of you know financial inclusion within the continent mm -hmm. actually if memory serves me right it should be around 40 something percent i think 42 43 there about mm. and that is a very low number if you think about it very and low of course it has grown over the past decade it has grown because it used to be in the 20s and we've mm. doubled that number to the 40s and that is awesome however that number needs to go to the 80s that number needs to go to the 90s right because that, that, that is that is where we need to be if, if you look at you know something um like other markets although in, in the other markets their financial inclusion is very different from what we consider financial inclusion yes in the in the united states in within mm -hmm. europe Mm -hmm. financial inclusion to them is how many people actually have a bank account yeah but in africa you know financial inclusion is not necessarily a, a tangible how bank account. easily can you send money <laughs> yes how yeah exactly that how easily can you can you access money yeah. digitally you know yeah. that is our financial inclusion and so we, we we still have a lot you know a lot to do we have a long way to go there's a lot to be built and mm -hmm. One of the things that I would say is that we've not yet seen the end of fintech apps. I will not lie to you. Glad <laughs> you know, Glad I, you. I know, I know, I know, I know. A lot of us feel like okay, there's too many of them, and I agree with you. There's too many of them, but they not stop that. coming there's up. Too many, yeah. and 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 they yeah, get but... funding, and I wonder how. It's the same story through and through. <laughs> <laughs> and they will, they will not, they will not stop, they will not stop sprouting every other day. Yeah. until we solve the problem of financial inclusion right. and until that day and i don't know when that day will be it's going to be survival for the future so who can survive the longest which fintech mm -hmm. can survive the longest mm -hmm. to be able to be the last man standing because they are going to be the winner you know within yeah. the continent right. yeah okay so i hopefully you know our our foundation or our basis is very different from the rest of the world you know for us it's ease of ease of how fast you can send money to somebody miles away maybe for the western yeah. world it's more of how many people can can have a bank account how easy is it it is to swipe a card and move on so hopefully we get with whatever standards or procedures there are to measure we yeah. get there to 90 80 percent as soon as possible and just you know the exactly. other day the google io uh forum was was done uh, I think two, three weeks ago. And, you know, AI has been the word of the day. What do you think yeah. is the role of AI or machine learning in improving these financial services as far as fintech is con concerned in the continent? The, the one thing I can think of is when it comes to transaction monitoring in an aim to reduce fraud. Because right. it's, it's the one thing that has killed a lot, a lot of startups, mm. you know? Um, there, there is there is a startup that mm -hmm. literally closed down yeah. because of a scam called chargeback. What so is that? this is the, this is the case you? whereby you, <laughs> <laughs> you 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 make a payment. Yeah. Uh, let's say, for example, using your card. Right. And then once you make that payment, you cancel, and then you claim that you are, you did not receive a refund whoa so now you end up getting paid twice yeah yeah and this happens a lot with fintech products so mm -hmm. you find that app x has a virtual card so i go and pay for a certain product mm -hmm. and then i cancel that product so uh let's say for example that transaction didn't go is through. refunded yeah yes or didn't go through yeah. most times actually yes that transaction did go through and then i come and claim that it, the money was deducted from my account but and i need it back yes I mean, and the way and the way cards operate you know they they, they these these rules on how cards operate so mm -hmm. if the issuing if the issuing service is visa or mastercard you know yeah. they have their own rules about customer complaints so if a mm -hmm. customer goes to a bank and says X amount of money was not refunded, then Visa will force that transaction to be refunded. You know? So yeah. when that is done and it was a false transaction, then it ends up becoming a chargeback fraud. So yeah. you're finding that the certain startup will get charged twice for one transaction. Mm. 
So when that happens a lot, let's say over a thousand transactions, you yes. find someone loses a lot, a lot of money. money. Yes. A lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So this, these are the kind of frauds that we've seen in the fintech space. Mm. And it has actually even stopped some fintech apps from implementing virtual cards. Okay. And then we've seen other fintech apps charge you, the user, for trying to buy something when your balance is low using your card. Mm -hmm. So if you try to make a purchase and your card is on low balance, the fintech app charges you because they're suspecting that to be you trying to defraud them. Ah, makes sense. Yeah. And they should, yes. they should, so, because yeah. you know you, your card is low. Why are you making that transaction? <laughs> and of course, <laughs> this has not made a lot of people happy, but oh well, yeah. uh, <laughs> some, some, something has to give. And then on the other yes. hand, uh, just, just as I was talking about, you know, transaction monitoring, mm -hmm. AI is the one way that we can, you know, implement AI, sprinkle AI within the future mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. to bring down fraud, but definitely yeah. not at zero, but significantly bring down the fraud because right. some of these, some of these, yeah, some of these parameters that we currently have are manually set. You know, they are like, oh, if you see a new account, try to make a transaction of X amount within two hours, mark that as a suspicious account, mm -hmm. and then let a human being actually go through it to see, you know, all of those things. Mm -hmm. It's pretty manual. But yeah. if we could have all that automated, you automated. know, to make things easier and faster, and this can be achieved through AI. And then the other end of the spectrum is also when it comes to um, things like onboarding, you know, if I'm registering on an app, you know, how fast can it be? You know, current technology about onboarding and things. Yeah. So there's something we call liveness check. So this is essentially when, when you're registering for a FinTech app, it mm -hmm. asks you to take a video of yourself. Some of them will ask you to smile. Some of them will ask you to show, you know, your hands, things like yeah. those. And the quality is never good. The quality I've been is bad. That. I've been exactly through that. that. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some people some people are still able to defraud even such a system, you know. Yeah. So if we could sprinkle some AI into that, you know, mm -hmm. it would make everything just a bit better, everything, you know, to be more user friendly. Right. Okay. We yeah. hopefully that can be implemented into the industry and you know make this better because there's a lot of fraud, especially cyber fraud, gosh. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that is the that is that is the genesis of wash wash anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> so true, yeah. yeah. So if that can be curbed, there would be a loss of business for a lot of people, but good for business yeah. also. Yeah, so just uh, on to that, talking about investment and funding, because, you know, you mentioned um, if, if maybe such transactions happen over a thousand uh, profiles, then, you know, that brings down an entire company. And just highlighting the investment at a company called Interswitch, which is a fintech, Nigerian fintech company, it provides payment processing solutions and it hit over one billion in valuation a couple, a couple months back. So what do you think is... Um, how is the, what is the industry looking like for investment in Africa, fintech investments, you know, uh, with, with all the money coming in, <laughs> the, you know, they're getting money. Yeah. What, what, what does the environment look like? So statistically speaking, uh, investments have generally just gone down. It's not just in Africa, but across the globe because, I mean, you know, recession. there's been, yeah, there's been a looming session, uh, uh, that, just that cloud of doubt hovering over yeah. everyone. Right. But we've also seen there's still, of course, some, some startups have still been able to, you know, close some significant mm. rounds. Big. Even wondering the other day, you know, someone is announcing a round and they're like, how do they raise that much money in a right? session? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, must be nice. <laughs> it must be nice. But, <laughs> yeah, um, so what I would say is that as much as there's been a slowdown, what is happening is that investors are just scrutinizing a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for this is not just about because of the recession, it's actually because we've also seen an influx of failed startups, a lot of failed startups, especially in the fintech space. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a number of people point out that you know the fintech space is full of fraudulent founders, who and just support wash wash and money <laughs> don't leave, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. as much as people might just think, oh, this is just random Twitter folks talking about this, investors are on Twitter as well. Investors get to see all of this news. Investors mm -hmm. are able to get wind of all these things happening. 
Yeah. And of course, if, I, if an investor burns their cash in one fintech, next time they are investing in a fintech, there'll be, there'll be more questions, there'll be more yeah. skeptical about things. You know, you, can't, you, you can no longer just go and sell a dream. You know? mm. Right now, someone wants you to sell the bed as well. <laughs> They're like, you know, what, don't just sell me the dream. You know? sell, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. show us, show us, you know, is this really possible? Is this something that can be done? We want, we yeah. want some tangible, uh, you know, mm. out of this. So that's yes. the one thing that I would say is happening. But in no way, in no way will FinTech in Africa die. In no way <laughs> will, will VCs and investors stop pouring money into FinTech. I'm telling that. you this. It is because <laughs> it's the one thing that is the hardest problem to solve. Because even these investors themselves go through these problems. Right. Ask someone to send you money today, and they'll ask you which platform should I send through. Even if you're using banking grains, it takes two, three days. Now imagine if it was an emergency. Yeah? Imagine if you have your aunt in the States, and you're in hospital, you need to clear a bill, your aunt is supposed to send you that money, and now you have to wait two, three days. The hospital bill has gone up for those two, three days, so now she has to send you more money. You get, like, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not something that has been solved yet. And until that day, whereby I can be able to send money from Kenya to South Africa and it reaches them in real time in an instant, and yeah. someone from UK can send to me in an instant, mm. then that is the day things will slow down. But until then, I promise you, money is going to be continued poured into FinTech. Right. So, I just what what do you think is the role of international investors? I've, Personally, in all these stories about uh, somebody getting a round of funding, mostly it's usually yeah. international investors. So what do you think is the role of international investors and the impact of funding on the growth of fintech in Africa? Maybe in the next um, 5, 20 years. First, I would just like to say thank you to all international investors. <laughs> <you're leaving> us. <laughs> you know, as a continent, we believe that... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for believing in the dream that we can solve, uh, we can solve problems. But yeah, yeah. Um, one thing, and mm-hmm. I know I've seen, I've seen this, and there's been banter around. You know, you can only get funding if you have a white co-founder. Mm, is it true or not? And, and I, 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 I don't think it's true because right. we've seen, we've seen mm-hmm. predominantly, not just predominantly, but we've seen an all-black startup. Like you know, Google also Health. getting Internet yes, and, and also yeah, some time back exactly, and they yeah. get funding. You know, um, I think what happens here is that you know, and it's 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 some form of you know, it's some form of bias that we yeah. have when we are complaining about this. Mm-hmm. And the question that I would be asking is that why is it that Africans and billionaire Africans mm. are not investing in startups? Mm. You know. Because the problem here is that our culturally, we don't make money through investing in startups. We make money in Kufungua Car Wash. We make money in running a salon. Yes. yes, we make money in building apartments, you know, yeah. all those kind of things. Real estate, people yeah. don't be, yes, real estate. People don't believe in making money by investing in a startup. You know, yeah. you know, and a startup is not a business. A startup is not a butchery. A startup is not a saloon where yeah. you go collect your money at the end of the day. Some startups and you're take sure years for you, yes, for you to get your money back. Right. And because of because of lack of that culture, mm-hmm. then we find that we don't have a lot of black investors within the continent or African investors, if I may say. Mm-hmm. So what happens is that these uh, founders who are trying to raise funds. Yeah. they will go and raise funds from abroad to the people who are giving out the money. Even you today, if you, you know, if you, if you were raising funds and, and you realize that, okay, like, yes, Africans <laughs> are not giving you money. You're going to, you're, yes, you'll register your company in the States or the British Virgin Islands and raise money there. Will, yes, <laughs> <I'm there. laughs> So it's it's just a matter of opportunity. As a as a founder, where is the opportunity? The opportunity is abroad. I will go abroad to get money to build my startup. If yeah. more Africans were giving were, were giving funds, were, were investing more, if we had more angel investors, yeah. then we would totally see a lot more African startups getting funded mm-hmm. within the continent. Right. That's yeah. that's 
I think I also I believe I believe I believe so if we had more because we have billionaires in the continent, why are they not supporting yes. this? Right. Exactly. So if more yeah. of them could just believe in us, then it would be easier to build for Africa by Africa. It's mostly yeah. a statement said rather than done. So hopefully in the future more of them can build within or in the continent. And that brings me to yeah. the question of uh, challenges or you know just the future outlook of fintech. Do you think there are any? What are some of the challenges and what do you, how do you think they could be addressed? You know, faced faced by the fintech industry. I, there's um, the infrastructure limitations, and then there's the cyber fraud yeah. and maybe digital literacy. So, how? What are some of the ways you think it can either be reduced or just eradicated totally? And you yeah. know, what what does the future look like in that aspect as far as the challenges are concerned? All right. Um. So, pardon me in advance for this, but I'm going to answer your questions as per my experience, which means right. I'm going to talk about yellow card a lot. Okay. Because you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. on, on the on the on the first on the first one about you know infrastructure limitations, I would say is if if fintechs could generally you know reduce their reliance on banking rails, mm-hmm. we'd see a lot more uptime. You know, we'd see a lot more reliability. Yeah, because the problem comes in by whereby. The fintech that is telling you send instant money from country X to country Y mm. is relying on a bank in country X and a different bank in country Y. Mm-hmm. So it becomes a whole problem because, as we know, banks are not always reliable. Yeah. So the one thing that we have seen and is the one thing that at Yellow Card we are actually building upon is that we are using the power of crypto to you know meet these remittance requirements. You know, mm-hmm. if 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 I can if I can take advantage of you know stable coins, and by stable coins I mean these are cryptocurrencies that are attached to actual commodities. So in this case, it could be a crypto dollar, so USDT or mm-hmm. USDC. So mm-hmm. one crypto, one USDT is one dollar, one for one. Uh-huh. So we are using we are using that to be able to move these funds from one customer to the other. First of all, protecting you from the volatility of different currencies, yeah. because you know the exchange rate between currency X, currency right. Y yeah. is a mess and everything. So if you could do those transactions using dollars, yeah. then it is wonderful. So for us, what 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 we enable, you know, is a customer can easily go into our app, you know, buy uh, the crypto dollars and then send those crypto dollars to someone else, let's say from Kenya to South Africa, mm-hmm. and then the person in South Africa receives the crypto dollars, and then they are able to withdraw those crypto dollars as local currency. So yeah. they are able to get that as a branch. And yeah. that's, it, it's something that works instantly. And for us, when we say instant, it's actually instant because we are relying on an instant transaction because we are not using the banking rails. We are using, mm-hmm. you know, the crypto, uh, the crypto rails. Yeah, and, and then, yes. And then on the second part about fraud, um, what I would say is there has to be collaboration within the industry. You right. know, we can't, we can't continue working in silos whereby everyone has their own individual sanctions list. Everyone has their own, you know, things. Some mm-hmm. companies don't even want to report fraud because they don't want to be seen as, oh, we lost X amount of money. We, you know, talking yeah. about these things, yeah, talking about these things makes the industry wake up. Mm. So collaboration when it comes to fighting fraud is the one way that I can think of that will lead to redemption, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Because if, if if a customer is red is, is flagged in platform X because because they've been fraudulent and that has been proven, mm-hmm. we need to have a shared database that has these fraudulent transactions. Yeah. So that I'm able to go and see, oh, okay, we also had a similar transaction from the same customer. We need to block them before we lose money. And report if you can. And re- Exactly. Because what is happening here is we've, we are seeing a lot of customers moving from one app to the other, yeah. doing the same crime. Yeah. Because no one is sharing information. So collaboration, that would be very awesome. Right. Uh, and the third one that you said, if you could kindly remind me? Digital literacy. Yes, about digital literacy. Again, here I am to plug yellow card. 
So on Yellowcard, if you go to our website, yellowcard.io, mm -hmm. um, we actually have a whole digital literacy plan. And what we do is we have an academy. So for the academy, it would be academy.yellowcard.io. And here we, we have full, I would say full lessons about cryptocurrency, about blockchain and general financial literacy. Right. And we also, we also do something called financial literacy tours, uh, both in Kenya, and Nigeria, and I think Ghana as well, whereby we do these financial literacy, literacy tours within campuses, within communities, you know, to talk more about you know, how can we make money grow for ourselves, you know, as individuals. Uh, what, what technologies can we leverage to, to make money work for us? Just the other day, we had one in Sika, you know, with one of our partners called Circle. And then we usually do this with our other partner called Cheza. And we just basically talk to students and business people and talk to them about the power of stable coins, the power of using the blockchain to pay for mm -hmm. commodities. If you want to make a payment for your importation in Dubai, in China, it's much faster and cheaper for you to use stable coins or cryptocurrency in general. So yeah. these are the kind of financial literacy that we go talking about. You know, how do you save? Can you use cryptocurrency to save? Such kind of things, you know? Just exactly. sharing exactly that, you know? As opposed to telling people, oh, here you just get rich. No, <laughs> we actually go ahead and talk about the platforms. What is NFT? What is Web3, you know? What is, what is Tether, for example, Tether Gold? What yeah. is the Metaverse? You know, just trying to teach communities everything. And then for us ourselves, we've even built this into difficulty levels. So there's beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels. So if you're going in there to learn more about, you know, financial services, more about the cryptocurrency world, you are mm -hmm. able to, you know, you are able to read articles based on your level. So if you're a beginner, you can advance all the way up to a proper, you know, person who knows about crypto and all of those things. I'm signing up for the beginner class right away. <laughs> that's a lot yes, of and, and, missing out on <laughs> and it's and it's totally free and no one actually charges you for anything access it at any time yeah. and yeah i think the masses yep. really need something like that i didn't know you guys offered so much so i think that's 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 very nice and it's a good way to really put that education about fintech and just finance out to the masses so yeah, as, yeah we do Mm -hmm. as we as we come to a close and yeah unfortunately so uh what yeah. do you think is uh the future of fintech what, where do you see fintech five ten years what do you think you'll be talking about you know uh in the in the industry or what what is your dream or your envision for the potential wow. areas of growth and innovation in the industry um i would say my expectation is that in five to ten years mm -hmm. I, I can easily, you know, send money Anywhere. across the continent, mm -hmm. across the globe, mm. at very friendly prices, and that person receives that amount instantly without having to download five or ten different apps. <laughs> Secondly, I also envision a world whereby I can use any payment method to pay for any service mm. across the world, you know? Yeah. Um, the, li the likes of Spotify, whereby mm -hmm. we are able to pay for Spotify through M Pesa. M Pesa, yes. You know, that's a very good. That's a very good start. The other the other mm -hmm. day, Google had enabled you know M Pesa as well for you to be able to yeah. buy apps using M Pesa. Microsoft mm -hmm. Store also has a similar functionality where you can pay for games. You can buy apps uh, on the Microsoft Store through M Pesa, yeah. and a lot of people it. don't know this. I've been yeah. waiting for that for a long time. Yeah. That's, that has been there for a while, but a lot of people don't actually know this. I do. So I envision, <laughs> imagine, I envision a day whereby I can go to Amazon mm -hmm. and I don't need to use a card. I can card. just use a yes. I can use whichever app. I can use yellow card to just pay for that service. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That is where I envision us for us to get to. Whereby mm -hmm. I can also go to Omamboga and Omamboga not only accepts m -Pesa, but Bitcoin. Mama Boga also accepts Bitcoin. <laughs> Mama Boga accepts USDT and USDC. You know, yeah. such kind of range. And that yeah. is where I envision that we are going to get to in the next five to ten years. 
Yeah, that's I. I also I also I'm looking forward to seeing that, and I hope it's not yeah. when I'm too old and I can't use this technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could be waiting a long time. Hopefully, it's in the next five ten years, and I still have the strength to appreciate this technology and just marvel at how far we have come. So yeah. just just the last bit, yeah. So how do you think? What are some of the benefits of uh, fintech maybe somebody may, may, may be listening and they're wondering okay so what what is this to me what what does this mean for me how how is fintech what, how do you see fintech transforming various sectors of the economy apart from just the payment methods and some of the benefits of fintech for both individuals and businesses the one thing that i can say and this is the hill that i choose to die on Achille fintech is will save you money Exactly. Right. Fintech will save you money mm. because even as we see this competition coming up, different fintech platforms coming up, mm. it's getting cheaper and cheaper to send money both for businesses and individuals. Mm-hmm. So the one thing that I know for sure is the biggest benefit is that fintech platforms will save you money, even mm. when it comes to getting loans, you know, mm-hmm. which means that we will be able to get loans for cheaper, for lower interest rates. We'll be able to get loans faster. Yeah. All of these things, we're able to do our transactions faster and everything. And all of that will transform into saving money. Okay. At the end of the day, it's all about saving that money, right? You know, how fast exactly. can I be effective and low cost? So that's the whole yes. point of fintech. I think also exactly that's that. the selling point of most of these apps. So yeah. as, as long as we find a base where we can get it effectively and at low cost, I, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm always in, yeah? So yeah, yeah I, it's been a pleasure, absolutely, having you on the podcast. And I have personally, I have learned so much. Yeah, I, I live in a bubble, as you've said, and it's good to <laughs> always <laughs> deconstruct that ideology and just learn new things. So this has been a wonderful session. It's been lovely having you on the on the podcast, and I'm looking forward to having yet more sessions with you because, as you call yourself, the fintech guy. We are looking yeah. forward to having more sessions with you to learn more about fintech and what is happening in the fintech space. So anybody who wants to follow you, what's your LinkedIn, the Twitter handle? Um, everything, um, Saruni BM, wherever mm-hmm. social media. Mm-hmm. So whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's Medium, uh, whether it's Twitter, um, at Saruni BM, that is my social handle. Yeah. All right, guys, you've had the fintech guy he's you can follow him ask any questions he's a friendly guy i promise and i hope to see you guys <laughs> on the next episode of space Attack. it's been a lovely session until next time see you bye thank you so much bye